Hey everyone, and welcome everybody here and online as well. Our script reading is from the book of John, chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 10 to 14. So John, chapter 4, starting in verse 10. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who is, who is that asks for you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as, also, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So I just went on a short vacation, and you might have guessed that it involved cycling of some kind. So yeah, I went on a bike trip. So I rode from uh, on the Icefields Parkway in uh, Jasper, between Jasper and Lake Louise. And on these winter trips, I bring thermoses, because uh, otherwise the water's going to freeze. <clears throat> if I just bring like a, <clears throat> excuse me, a normal water bottle, the water's going to freeze and I won't be able to drink it. So I bring thermoses, put hot stuff in it, so I have water during the whole day. And... On this trip, I learned a pretty important lesson, I think. So in the morning, on one day, I filled up one thermos. I have two liters of liquids that I could bring. So one thermos had coffee and hot chocolate mixed together. The other one had chicken broth. So pretty good, I guess, in, in a sense. I like chicken broth. But I rode all day and then refilled in Lake Louise. I refilled with more coffee and hot chocolate and drank a coffee when I was in Lake Louise and then just left and th left town. And then the, the temperature started to heat up. So generally it's kind of cold, but this, it started floating around zero. So zero, two degrees, three degrees. And I just started craving like this clean, clear water. And all I had was like coffee and hot chocolate. I drank all that. Then I had this chicken broth, which I mixed too much chicken broth in it. So it was like this ridiculously salty sludge. And I was so thirsty. You know, I probably wasn't dehydrated in the sense because I was taking liquids in. But I just really, really craved water, something that actually quenched my thirst. So I was glad. I found, uh, I was riding along and there's a spring that was sticking out of, uh, out of the side of the hill. There's this pipe that sticks out of one part of the road uh, that I was familiar with. So I, I saw this pipe and it was pouring out water. It wasn't frozen. So I was happy. So I actually had to use my thermos to bash away the ice so I can get some water in there. And I dumped out this horrible chicken broth, <laughs> filled up with water. And it, and it really satisfied me. It's, it's one of those things where I had liquids, but it wasn't satisfying me. I needed the clean, clear water, just something that was just cold water. And that relates to a lot of things in life. And that's, that's the example that Jesus was using in this time that he was talking to the Samaritan woman. You know, people in, li in our lives, we often try to fill ourselves or fill our lives with things that don't truly satisfy us. Uh, wealth is the biggest one that people talk about, I think. You know, you, you try to, well, there's that saying, money doesn't buy happiness, you know, but it does make you more comfortable. So you can have money, but it, and it will satisfy certain needs, and it's going to make you more comfortable, but it's not going to truly satisfy you. There's lots of wealthy people that are very unhappy. And a lot of them, when they relate to why they're unhappy, they talk about how, you know, it's nice to have wealth and possessions and all of these things, but you still need things in your life that are beyond that. You still need things that can truly satisfy you. And we're going to look at this passage where Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman at the well and how he describes a water that does truly satisfy, something that's going to fill that need in your life. You know, there's a lot of teachings that are out there as well that um, might sound good, just like, you know, coffee and hot chocolate might sound good at one time or chicken broth, but it's not going to truly satisfy you. Uh, and the teachings that are in the scriptures are those things that are going to truly satisfy us. They're going to give us that, that quenching of the thirst that we actually need. So we're going to be in John chapter 4 for a lot of this, in a sense. Uh, we're going to always going to come back and refer to some of the verses in there, but we're going to jump around a little bit. Uh, one passage we're going to go to right now is in John chapter 7. If you go ahead a few chapters. Jesus was meeting with the Samaritan woman. Uh, the setting is, is that uh, they're at a well. Uh, that's been a well there for a really long time. She even refers back to her ancestors, talking about how they used it in, pa in the past as well. And Jesus came up and was talking to the Samaritan woman, which at the time was somewhat controversial, because uh, Jewish people tended not to, or tended to avoid Samaritans, and then also he's a male speaking to a woman as well, so kind of doubled up on the, um, you know, the situation where he was kind of breaking the social norms in that way. And 
he wanted a drink. So he asked her for a drink on his way to Galilee. Uh, and he used this opportunity where they were quenching their thirst to talk about this living water. And the question that you might ask is, what is this living water that Jesus is referring to? Uh, this water that's always going to satisfy you. Uh, in John chapter 7, it talks in, uh, about how this refers to the Holy Spirit and the role that it plays. So John 7, we'll look at verses 37 to 39. So John chapter, 7, uh, John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, uh, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So at the time this was written, uh, the New Testament church had not yet been established. The New Covenant had not yet been established. That's when Jesus ascended into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. And that's what's being referred to when he was glorified. And then the Holy Spirit comes down, and we get that indwelling of the Holy Spirit when we become Christians. We're going to look at a few passages that deal with that. Uh, also, at this time, the Holy Spirit was coming down and was going to give the message uh, to the disciples, the apostles at that time, to, in, uh, that inspiration of the Holy Spirit, where they gave us the New Testament that we read today. And this, New Test or this Holy Spirit is something that uh, rivers of living water will flow from within them. So there's that metaphor where the Holy Spirit is referred to as a water. You know, something that's coming and it's going to flow through them, so we're going to get that teaching of the Holy Spirit. And those teachings lead to salvation and eternal life. This is the message that God is giving us to uh, be reconciled with him again. Uh, so we're going to look at the nature of this living water that is going to truly satisfy, the one that Jesus was talking about to the Samaritan woman, uh, and how the Holy Spirit plays into that, how the Holy Spirit is this living water that we receive. Uh, back in John chapter 4 and verse 14, one important thing that we have to recognize with this living water, it is, it's something that we actually have to drink. We have to partake of it ourselves. John 4 and verse 14, it says, Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. So whoever drinks the water, we actually have to drink the water. It's something that we have to do on our side of things. You know, so how do we drink this living water? How do we drink this living water, which is referring to that Holy Spirit? How do we do this? Uh, if you go to Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, and we'll read verse 38. This is a very popular verse, uh, because this is right at this time where the New Testament church was being established. So Jesus was glorified. So now, uh, back in John 7, it talks about how the Holy Spirit had not yet come because Jesus wasn't glorified. Now we're at the point where the, Jesus was glorified. So the Holy Spirit has come. So Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. It says, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, we drink of the Holy Spirit upon our conversion. When we repent and we're baptized, when we accept that gift that Jesus and God has offered to everybody on the earth, uh, this indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the gift from God. We get this Holy Spirit when we accept it, when we drink from it. Uh, that's something that is shown that we do have to drink the living water. There's something that we have to do on our side of things. Uh, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll look at verse 13. This is a passage that uh, deals and refers directly to that idea of drinking from the Holy Spirit. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. For we were all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, and we are all given the one Spirit to drink. So God offers us the Holy Spirit to us as a gift. Uh, he's giving it to us, but we still have to take action. We have to accept that gift. You know, just like any time you get a gift. If you get a present for your birthday or for Christmas or whatever, it doesn't do any good if it just sits there and, and you don't unwrap it. You, know, you have to accept it. You have to take it and use it. And it's the same way that God is offering this gift to everybody on the earth, and we just have to accept it. We have to drink. We have to drink this living water. We have to have uh, action on our part to partake of what God is offering to everybody as a gift. Uh, if you go to Ephesians chapter 5, you know, we accept the Holy Spirit, we drink of the Holy Spirit when we accept his gift, when we repent and we're baptized, uh, when we become Christians and we're dedicated to him. 
And we also continue to drink of the Holy Spirit as we seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, after that conversion point, we still have a life to live afterward. That's just the first step of a long journey. And we are going to continue to be filled with that Spirit. We're going to continue to drink of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Ephesians 5, verses 18 to 20. So Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 18. It says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God, the Father, for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, we are here we have that comparison of drinking. And he's making a comparison here of drinking wine, uh, which leads to debauchery. So that leads to kind of bad things. And he's saying, instead of doing that, drink from the Holy Spirit. So fill yourself with the Spirit. Fill yourself with the teachings of the Scriptures. Uh, accept that indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we are to drink of the Spirit after baptism, after we are converted. Now, after we have that act of accepting and drinking, initially, we have to continue to drink and be filled with that spirit. Uh, we do this through singing and making melody in our heart. Uh, we're going to have that spirit filling within us, you know, as we sang this morning and sing at other times. Uh, singing, uh, through singing, we, ha we have that emotional connection while we sing. It's also a way that we learn things. You know, we learn things through metal melody. That's something that we do as humans as well. Uh, that's an often a trick that's taught if you're trying to learn something for a test or for whatever. Uh, you make a little song in your head about it, you know, and that's one trick that you can use to learn things. The same thing happens when we're singing the hymns, uh, when we sing here on Sunday morning and other times. We learn from those teachings, and those things help us remember what the Holy Spirit is teaching us, and we're being filled with the Spirit. We're drinking of the Spirit as we do these things. You go ahead one chapter to Ephesians chapter 6, and look at verse 17. You know, singing songs is something that uh, gives us that emotional lift, that emotional connection. Uh, it also teaches us, and the teaching that the song should be formed from is the Word of God. Ephesians 6 and verse 17. It says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So this is one passage out of a long passage about uh, talking about armor and these certain things that God is providing to us uh, for our protection and our learning as well. Uh, this one is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's something that uh, the sword of the Spirit, the Spirit has given us this teaching, the Word of God. And we are to take that and we are to drink from it continually. Again, something that we have to keep going back to and studying the Word of God so that we can be filled with that Spirit, filled with the teaching that He has provided to us on this earth. Uh, go back a few chapters to Ephesians 3 and verse 16. As Christians, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and it's going to give us strength. It's going to give us power. Ephesians 3 and verse 16. It says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being. So again, we have that gift of the Holy Spirit. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this Holy Spirit is the same thing that provided us the entire New Testament. It's the power of God which raised Jesus from the dead. And we have this indwelling within us, and it's going to give us that strength and this power. You know, again, as we pray, as we access this, as we study the word, it's going to give us that strength to get through our lives, and it's going to give us that water that's going to satisfy us through our journey uh, in this life. It's going to give us that power that we need. So we can see this similarity between the living water of Jesus that Jesus was talking about with the Samaritan woman and the relationship between the Holy Spirit and the Christian. You know, we have this living water that we drink from that Jesus was referring to, uh, to the Samaritan woman. God gives us the Holy Spirit at baptism, and it's our responsibility to accept it, to drink from it. And it's also our responsibility to continue drinking from it as we live our Christian life. Uh, back in John chapter 4, uh, we're going to look at part of verse 14 again. Again, Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman. Uh, John 4 and verse 14, he says, Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. So we just saw that we have to drink the water. We have to take action upon ourselves. And it's a living water that's going to quench our thirst. We're never going to thirst again. Again, when Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman, he, she was thinking about this literally. She's thinking, that'd be awesome. You know, like, I don't have to keep it coming down here and feeding all my, or making all my animals drink water. Myself as well, I have to keep drinking all the time. 
Um, but he's talking about a spiritual thirst, something that's going to quench our spiritual thirst. So how does the Holy Spirit quench our thirst? Uh, we're going to go to the book of Romans. We go to Romans chapter 5. The Holy Spirit meets all of our spiritual needs. Again, in, in life, uh, many people live life searching for meaning, searching for something that's going to fulfill them, and they can't do it. Um, the Holy Spirit will fulfill that need. It's going to give us that spiritual uh, satisfaction and thirst quenching that we are going to receive from it. Romans 5 and verse 5. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. So again, back with that metaphor of, of, of water, flowing water. The Holy Spirit's been poured out into our hearts. Uh, we have a spiritual need for the love of God. Uh, this is something that maybe people don't recognize at the times. They just know that something's missing. And that something missing is the, the love that God provides to us and provides to the whole earth. And he provides it to us through the Holy Spirit, through that pouring out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and also through the benefits of the teachings provided by the Holy Spirit. We benefit from those as we live our lives and as we learn from the teaching that has been poured out to us through the Holy Spirit. Go ahead to Romans chapter 8. Go ahead a few chapters. We'll look at verses 12 and 13 of Romans chapter 8. And we also have a spiritual need to put our old lives behind us. Uh, the Holy Spirit is going to help us do that. It's going to help us put away our old lives and put on the new lives as Christians. Romans 8, verses 12 to 13. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, or if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So this passage is talking about putting off your old life. When it's talking about living according to the flesh, that's, that's the life that's without Christ. That's just living kind of just to whatever you want to do according to the world. Uh, but if we want to live according to the Spirit, we have to put those things away and uh, put on this new life. Put on this new life according to the Holy Spirit and according to the teachings that are provided to us in the Scriptures. And when we do that, when we drink in the Spirit this way, it's going to meet that spiritual need of... Um, having that abundant life that only comes by living according to God's teachings. We're going to have that full life because of what the Holy Spirit's provided to us. So there's many ways that the Spirit quenches our spiritual thirst. Uh, the living water also springs up within ourselves. Back in John chapter 4, back in John chapter 4 and verse 14 again, when Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman, this living water, he refers to it how it springs up within you. So John 4 and verse 14. The water I give them, so this is Jesus talking, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So how is the Holy Spirit in us and kind of welling up within us? Uh, again, Romans chapter 8. We'll look at verses 9 and 11. So Romans chapter 8. How is this Holy Spirit in us and how is it welling up within us? The Holy Spirit dwells in us if we are in Christ, if we accept that gift. Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 9. We'll look at verse 9, and then we'll go to verse 11. So Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 9. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Then verse 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. So how is the Holy Spirit in us? It's in us when we are in Christ, when we are Christ's possession. And back in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, when we repent and are baptized, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's that indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And when we have that spirit of Christ, we belong to Christ. We are in Christ. We are part of his family. And this happens when we accept that gift, when we drink of the spirit. And it becomes a part of us just the same way water becomes physically a part of our physical bodies. And when we drink in water, it becomes a part of us. When we accept the Holy Spirit, it becomes a part of us as well. It becomes a part of our essence. Go ahead to Romans chapter 15. 
So we see how the, the Holy Spirit is within us, like a living water. And how does it spring up? You know, when Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman, he says, in them it will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So how does it spring up? How does it well up within us? Romans 15 and verse 13. So Romans chapter 15 and verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit springs up by helping the Christians overflow with hope. We have that hope that overflows within us. Uh, it gives us a joy and peace uh, when, we have, uh, when we have that knowledge of understanding that we are a possession of Christ, when we are in Christ, when we belong to him. When the Holy Spirit is a part of our essence, it's part of us. It's going to give us that hope that's going to get us through any circumstance. We're going to have that meaning of life understood, and it's going to be satisfied within us. Uh, and we are going to have a joy and peace that results because of that. Uh, we have this peace of life that surpasses all understanding. And it springs up within us and quenches that spiritual thirst. It's something that comes within us. Uh, if you go to Galatians chapter 5, look at verses 22 and 23. When you think of something springing up or overflowing, you know, when I saw the spring, I can see it overflowing. The water was coming out of it. Uh, this is something that happens as well. When a Christian is overflowing with the Holy Spirit, people are going to recognize it. There's going to be signs and things that you're going to see. And one of those things might be what we just talked about, where it's seeing that joy and peace that a Christian has. You know, when they're going through something that's really difficult, a difficult situation, they have a peace and a calm that somebody who doesn't have Christ might not have. And they're going to recognize that. They're going to see, why are you so calm during all this? Why do you have this joy and peace? And that's that overflowing of the Holy Spirit. Because of us accepting the Holy Spirit within us and following its teachings, we're being an example to them. It's something that's recognized. In Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, it also talks about how the Holy Spirit springs up and produces fruit in the life of the Christian. So Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So as we drink the Spirit through studying the, whole, studying the Scriptures, uh, putting them into practice, uh, you know, singing and making songs in our heart, you know, singing as a group on Sundays and other times, this is going to result in positive results in our life or positive things in our life. It's going to result in fruit. Uh, you know, when, you, when a tree grows, it produces fruit. It has all the things that it needs, all the nutrients, all the water, all of the things it needs to produce the fruit. God has given us everything we need to produce fruit as well. And that's through the Holy Spirit. Uh, we drink it in, we take it in, we accept it. It wells up within us and it overflows in the sense of being fruit in our lives that other people are going to recognize. You know, these different qualities. Uh, like the previous passage, it talks about joy and peace. You know, patience, forbearance, kindness. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are all things that people are going to recognize. And that's how the Holy Spirit is going to spring up and overflow in us, in our lives, is through that uh, fruit that we are going to produce as we follow what's presented in the scriptures. If you go back to John chapter 4 and verse 14. The Holy Spirit produces us that or produces within us that hope and peace, which is going to overflow. Also that fruit that other people are going to recognize. And it also results in the most important thing, and that's eternal life. Again, this is what, the, what Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman about. So John 4 and verse 14 says, The water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up into eternal life. So it's a spring of water that wells up. We saw how that happens, how that is occurring through the Holy Spirit. And it also results in eternal life. Uh, one thing to note is that the living water is not eternal life itself, but it results in everlasting life. You know, it's a spring of water welling up to eternal life. It's something that leads to eternal life. So how does the Holy Spirit result in eternal life? Uh, back in Galatians chapter 5. If you Galatians 5, we'll look at verse 5 of Galatians chapter 5. You know, through the Spirit, we wait for the hope of righteousness. Uh, we have this hope of eternal life through the Spirit. Galatians 5 and verse 5. For through the Spirit we eagerly await 
by faith, the righteousness for which we hope. You know, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. Uh, through the Spirit, we wait for this hope. We, we, we wait for this righteousness that's going to come. And what is that? Uh, if you go to Titus chapter 3, one of those things that we benefit from, we've talked about already, we, we benefit from things in this life as we follow the Scriptures. Uh, we get that fruit of the Spirit. And one other thing that we hope for, something that has not yet come, is that gift of eternal life while we're on this earth. Titus 3, I'm going to look at verses 5 to 7. So Titus chapter 3, starting in verse 5. He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. So we're renewed and justified by God's grace through the washing and rebirth of the Holy Spirit. Again, back to that water metaphor that's, that's carried on through both the Old Testament and the New Testament as well. You know, it's something that we are renewed and justified by God's grace. Uh, it's very encouraging in the first part of this passage where it talks about how it's not because of the righteous things we had done. So it's not something that we have to rely on ourselves to achieve. You know, we have the obligation to be obedient to the scriptures. But it's God's mercy that is saving us. It's his action and his power uh, through the Holy Spirit being poured on us generously that we are receiving this gift of eternal life. And it's because of his power and his promise that we can have this hope of eternal life. Uh, it's something that's going to be a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And it's something that we can trust. It's all because of this water that's going to quench everything that we need with respect to our spiritual needs. So the living water in John chapter 4 when Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman. It pertains to salvation and has particular reference to the gift of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian. Uh, it's given to those who become Christians, who repent and are baptized. They receive the gift and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And it's something that fills us and quenches our spiritual thirst through providing us this abundant life while we're on this earth. You know, as we follow the scriptures and put it to practice in our life, we're going to gain those benefits and we're going to have that full life of joy and peace, uh, with a hope that's going to be something that we can rely on, that hope of eternal life that we have. Uh, when we have that, we are going to be benefiting from what the Holy Spirit is giving, giving to us. It's giving us that water that is truly going to quench all of our spiritual needs. So are we enjoying the benefits of this living water that's presented to us? Uh, you know, it begins by responding to be becoming a Christian through baptism, through that repentance and baptism. And it also continues as Christians. We have to continue to drink that water and benefit from what the Holy Spirit has provided to us through the scriptures. So are you doing that? I'd like to offer that invitation. If you've not yet accepted Jesus on as your Lord, we can show you in the scriptures how to take that first drink uh, of this water that's going to truly satisfy. And if you're a Christian who's struggling in any way, again, we'd love to uh, help you in any way that we can if you make your needs known. And so that we can benefit from the water that's provided to us continually as we live our lives as Christians.